Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Good day, loyal viewers, and welcome back to another episode of the 40 OT podcast. I'm trying very hard to um, spice up the intros. To these podcasts, you've always got to keep it fresh, <laughs> new. But I, I just end up laughing at myself and retaking it. So we'll we'll leave this one in. So how how are you doing anyway? Like, have you had a good day? Let let me know. Get in contact <laughs> on my email. This is a very long intro. Today we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite secret lover, social media. Today I am joined by none other than Indy Andy. This is the first person that has actually been asked for. People have commented on my YouTube channel and sort of suggested people to have on the podcast. And Indy Andy was one of those people. For anybody who doesn't know him, he is a very successful YouTuber. He has just started up his own podcast and he talks all about autism and anything that is related to that subject. How are you doing, Andy? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing, Tom? We had a little bit of a chat before the, before we started the podcast. <laughs> As we've always, that's that's also something that, that I repeat on a near constant basis. Mm. Life, life is a bit dull and uh, down at the moment, but there's a lot of positives on the horizon. I'm feeling fairly hopeful for the short-term future. I wanted to ask you before we sort of started this podcast, mm. you have made your first podcast, your first podcast episode. How yeah. how was that? What do you talk about? Oh, well, uh, for those who don't know the name of my podcast, uh, it's called The Unmasked Podcast. And the first episode I did with Connor Ward, who is just, um, I don't know, a real supporter of the channel and just as me as a friend and things we talk quite regularly and the podcast episode itself was actually kind of similar to what uh we're potentially going to be talking about today was to do with autism on youtube the creator viewer divide which connor's a kind of the i don't know what the word would be (laughs) i guess i guess the expert on for him it's kind of like his thing but no, we just uh, we just talked about uh, those sort of things as well as go into our kind of love of Star Wars and things. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, well, you've always got to add a little bit of um, your personality into these things, don't you? Or else you're just a part of the, the corporate rollout, the uh, inf- <laughs> information stream. <laughs> also, for talking about things that are completely off topic which is something that my podcast is definitely wholesomely taking in. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I have to say, though, it was a really great uh, podcast episode. And, you know, I think I still have a long way to go, of course. But, you know, I think that's just part of the journey, really, Um, with uh, doing anything new. You kind of have to take it, you know, one step at a time and just see where it goes, really. I I definitely do think that it's podcasting's quite it's it's in a different world to kind of YouTubing. You've got to with YouTubing, you kind of got to work on your body language, facial expressions, tonality, and all of those kind of things just towards a camera. But with podcasting, you don't have any of that sort of body language and facial expressions unless you record it. But you got you got to work on your conversational skills. Mm. Your uh, your knowledge around it. You, there's a lot of different kind of aspects to it. It's like a, a self-help course. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
sort of uh, work on your skills, social skills. <laughs> Yeah, and also when you're doing like an audio-based podcast, I didn't actually realize at the time, but um, on the first episode, my kind of, I don't know, speaking inflections were not really on point. So um, if you li- if you listen to it, I don't really, I didn't really go, yeah, or mm-hmm, like acknowledging the p- person. Because mm-hmm. basically I do the podcasts mainly in a video format because that's i don't know for me it's great to actually see the person and have that kind of like interaction so really my podcast is not necessarily a traditional podcast but uh it is something i'm working on as i grow with it and uh things like that but yeah it was honestly just one of those things i forgot just the you know the going "Mm mm-hmm yeah (laughs) that Shall we talk a little bit about you, what your background is, who you are, what kind of stuff you do online? Yeah, no, sure. Um, My background, well, I'm 26. No, I'm not 26. I'm 28. Why do I go 26? (laughs) I have no idea. This is going brilliantly. (laughs) I know. I know. This is just a normal conversation for me. That's great. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, I'm 28. I'm from the UK. And I don't know, in terms of normal life, I'm a account assistant. So input and invoices, all of that lovely jazzy stuff, really. But YouTube is really uh, my home, which is, you know, the place that I want to be on all of the time because YouTube's great. But no, I run my own YouTube channel called Indie Andy, basically talking about autism, you know, just my experiences as an autistic person. Pretty much I've been doing that for... I've been doing YouTube for about four years and it's just gone strength to strength, to be perfectly honest. It's just, what else would you want to know about me, Tom? I'm quite, I'm quite interested. Well, what was your reason for making the channel? Like, do you have any hopes for, for what it could become or anything you want to change or any personal reasons that you want to do YouTubing? Um... I do it mainly as a release from like my own reality. So it's kind of, it was initially escapism to be honest, because at the time I wasn't really at a great place in my life because I was unemployed. I'd been unemployed for over a year and I did YouTube as an escape. Uh, It was really my fiance that uh, got me into YouTube in the first place. So she showed me like, I don't know, Mm. different types different types of YouTubers and things. And like that's how we connected, really. We would, you know, if I was at hers, we'd watch YouTube. If she was at mine, we'd watch YouTube. Uh, so she really got me into it. And I don't know, I just kind of thought, do you know what? I kind of need something to do, uh, keep myself motivated as well. So I don't know, <laughs> it, was, it was one day at, at my fiance's mum's house because we were living together at her mum's at the time. I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to record a video, see what happens. So I just did a, I think it was a 25 questions tag, you know, one of those <laughs> uh, really, really general things. Yeah. And and actually, over time, I just started to talk about my autism because, I don't know, it felt, it felt like something that I had, uh, well, I needed to talk about to people at the, at the time because I'd never really talked about it prior mm-hmm. to prior to YouTube and, and like I never expected to be where I am today like you know when I went into it I, I hope this is uh, kind of made my point clear really I didn't go with it into it with like an end goal I kind of just wanted to do it for fun and you know see where it led I completely understand like <laughs> it's uh, I started my channel when I was going through a really bad patch in my life I was I was at university and um Mm. I uh I was dating this girl who um I'd been dating for up for about two two years and um I was really close to her and I absolutely loved her and so she was one year younger than me I went to uni we stayed together I came down on the weekends as she sort of went to her own uni she went to quite a one that's that's far away and she broke up with me, and obviously, mm. like being being a very sensitive and emotional, lovey dovey soul like myself, 
I very much had a breakdown and um, mm-hmm. my outlet for the, the amalgamation of my ex breaking up with me and my mental health, I sort of needed an outlet. And yeah. um, most of my vid- f- first sort of early videos on YouTube were me just monologuing about my life struggles and stuff. <laughs> I can, I completely get that. It's, it's definitely been like one of, if not the most important things for me over the years having to make videos you've got to research and sort of look into things and and often provide your own personal thoughts on it so it's it it was quite like a a spark for me to improve myself in many different ways um as as you start to learn things and find new things out then your focus shifts from yourself to other people to kind of help them out you know, I think when you do it over and over again, it becomes less about you and more about other people, I guess. I think that's the thing for me personally. I don't know about you, Tom, but uh, that's the thing that uh, it just suddenly creeps up on you. It doesn't, uh, it's not like an instant switch sort of thing, you know, mm-hmm. where you were doing it for yourself and then instantly it's for other people. It's just become a gradual thing. But I think just to allude back to the previous question about, you know, where I want the channel to go, I guess for me, I just want it to be like a, you know, resource for people to, you know, uh, use whether they're uh, professionals or parents. And I don't know, just be kind of like an escape from time to time, you know, Mm. because I think... To the digital world. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, like an escape to the digital world, that that should really be like a book or I don't know. It sounds like a great film title or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> it links in quite nicely with the topic of the podcast. <laughs> oh, I-, I liked what you did there. That was great. Yeah. But before we chat about that, when, when were you diagnosed and what kind of journey and, and process did you go through after that diagnosis? Yeah. Well, I was diagnosed in, 1996 I was born in 1992 so I was about four or five years old when I was officially diagnosed wow yeah so for me it's it has been like a reality my whole life because I've I've known about it but I got told about it properly when I was about 10 because I started to (laughs) I started to have a self-awareness yeah that that exactly like that, that that's the same with me and it's same with like loads of people that I talk to. It's like, why 10? Like, <laughs> it must be the, the the age at which we realise how very different we are to other people. <laughs> it, it, it must be. It, it must just be implanted in our um, in our brains when we're born. It's like 10, you become fully self-aware. You become self-aware. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, what prompted me to ask uh, my mum about it. I, c- I can tell you, we were actually waiting for the ferry to cross the River Tyne because I live in the northeast of England, uh, Newcastle mm. upon Tyne. You know what? Yeah. You know, and um, where the Geordies live, all of that lovely yeah. stuff. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we were waiting for this ferry, and I don't know. I just sort of prompted the question because I kind of started to feel a little bit different from my peers and them um, things like that. Because I started to notice I was going into. Uh, separate classes and things because I was basically a part of this like special well um they called it the language unit it's basically it was basically for uh, people with their autism ADHD or uh, any kind of disability that impacts on learning basically at primary school Mm -hmm. so that's kind of when I started to realize oh you know I'm different from my peers and things but in terms of the journey itself it's it's been a long one i have to say like i say i was in like these uh specialized classes for communication because uh my communication i mean it's not great at the best of times now but it was <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah just social communication you know it was something that i had to learn and actually communicating with people without um doing the, the thing of just uh, you know uh, screaming for yeah. it you know that sort of that sort of thing the journey was uh, has been really long and quite complex and you know involved a lot of people so 
not only my family, but, you know, professionals and things. It was mainly through school. I didn't really get any other kind of like health based support. I think, I guess I must have decided that I didn't need it at the time. I guess like later on in life, obviously things got more complicated <laughs> with, with my journey. I, I was told that I was autistic when I was 10. I only really got s- support for things that were of, of difficulty and, and sort of asking my my mum about different aspects of autism. But it only really hit me when I was in my 20s. I, I, I didn't really appreciate it for, for what it is and, and sort of the, the ways that it makes me different until that sort of later stage. Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to say I kind of um, didn't really become appreciative of it until much later at the time like i think in secondary school it kind of made things worse really because um i I don't know i think i think people who are listening to this podcast if they've been through secondary school you kind of i don't know (laughs) you 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 know you know that's part of the autism experience (laughs) (laughs) the lovely autism experience yeah i I guess like the uh, social hierarchical stuff that comes with uh, secondary school it's oh, it's yeah. just mind an absolute minefield really but uh makes makes all of us just feel sick <laughs> thinking about secondary school did you did you have much much trouble in secondary school like uh, with like like bullying or, or isolation or anything like that if, if you want to talk about it of course no, no, no. I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, talk about it, though the details are very vague to me, to be perfectly honest with you. Pretty much in primary school, I was uh, bullied and then I changed secondary schools. Uh, it was to a different location, basically. It was what well, it was closer to home. Still got bullied there. So it, it kind of, they, I kind of thought, what's the common denominator? You know, it's not the people it must be me sort of thing oh no i I think that's kind of where like kind of my like natural stammer comes from because i'm i don't know i don't know i don't really stick up for myself (laughs) well i didn't at the time either i completely understand that like it's it's a lot of the time like we we as autistic people build up many layers of different defense mechanisms for coping with because it's it like we, we really do understate it even me saying it is understating it. It's, it is an absolute horrific ordeal. It's tr- traumatized a lot of people. It's and when you go through trauma, you kind of have to mold yourself to kind of fit with that environment because you, you're not gonna you're not gonna escape from it, and that can be quite tough. And I I, I definitely agree with you. I think mm. you know what one of those things for me was staying quiet and. Um, it, it's taken me like a long, long time to have, have kind of have the confidence to um, speak my mind and stand up for myself and stuff. It's, it's a difficult task. It, it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, for me in school, I was the person that had to work harder than uh, most people just to understand them, understand the material and stuff. And, you know, when you just, when I, when I just had uh, people, I don't know, um, uh, say and stuff about like my weight or the way I look or you know those um nicknames that people gave you I mean I got the nickname sideburns which I thought was quite entertaining because you know they used my surname and then just put side at the front of it wow very intelligent well done <laughs> and, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think overall though if I didn't have those experiences, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. So even though obviously it wasn't great, obviously great, of course, but you know, I, I don't think about that those uh, those times with fondness really. But I kind of just I don't know, go into everything with like, well, try to be as positive as I possibly can to actually try and help people because you know, I guess it's just one of those things that you know has come through from that experience. Just want to help people. Gives you kind of like a a personal understanding of how cruel life can often be. <laughs> I, I I definitely feel that as well. Like if someone explains explains to me like, oh, I'm I'm really struggling and stuff, and they they're getting all emotional about it, and I can't help but like 
try to help because it's like, please don't be in this state of pain. Like, <laughs> it's it's awful for me to to witness that, and, and it's even worse when I feel like people could do a tiny little bit more to help, but mm. they just don't. It's it's very fr- frustrating. I don't know. You kind of have to have that uh, ex- experienced in order to help others, I guess. Yes. And if yeah, yeah, and if they haven't had it, then it's. I guess you know you have to be able to understand something before you can actually do it. I guess, which I, I guess that's kind of the thing with everything that anyone does. I guess people who are like Crohn's disease advocates, a large majority of those are people with Crohn's, and like people trying to like help others are affected in in some way. Like just look at like people who get into psychology. <laughs> Most of the people <laughs> at uni who are in psychology that I met. A large portion of them had their own sort of difficulties and mental health stuff. So it's, it seems to be a, a, a trend, or maybe it's like the human's natural communal way of overcoming things that are negative. Now that we are uh, about 25 minutes in, of course, we are both very actively engaged with the internet through our social medias and our channels and podcasts and stuff. So I thought that today would be a good it would be good to talk about social media. What are the benefits, what are the downsides, etc. First of all, let's talk about our own personal experiences as creators. Could you tell us about the positive and negative sides to using social media as a creator? I have to say that the positives do outweigh the negatives for me personally, because I mean, I think social media has been great because I've been able to uh, connect with people that I would never have uh, met in my day to day life. So, such as yourself, Tom. To be honest, uh, Thank you, you know, very much. that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we wouldn't have met without um, social media. You know, so that's obviously something I wanted to bring up. For me, social media has been quite positive and actually building like a. Uh, you know, just different networks on social media has been really, really mm. good as well. Loads of the things I would uh, do before YouTube were, you know, in collaboration with other people. So this whole indie andy thing on social media is me on a canvas. It's um, like everything like, that goes onto that channel. It's all, it's all me, you know, all of the editing and all that stuff. And I guess that's the gratifying thing about social media you know people you know comment or talk about you know the things that you're doing and it's it's actually quite infectious it's you know it's it's quite motivating um i like i read i read all the comments and things that people leave and it's i don't know it's it's just a really positive thing about social media you get that interaction with um you know people you don't even know it's a it's a nice thing and it's it's just lovely really um what about you what what do you think the positives are to being a social creator? I have found an immense sense of purpose in YouTubing, which sounds, sounds quite quite silly on paper, but it's not necessarily the, the, the videos and podcasts themselves. It's more what the, what opportunities they open f- hmm. for me to, to sort of pursue my goals. And, you know, my, my goals is to kind of get to a point where I can speak on on very public and mainstream platforms about issues that you know really should be kind of (laughs) seen for what they are and and fixed on some level yeah such as mental health and comorbidities and stuff and there's there's lots of different areas in in which it's kind of opened me up to is it's it's helped with my cv for just just general jobs my, my teaching job it's it's allowed me to have a reason to, to to educate myself about autism and the, and the things that surround it. It's it's given me a way to to help people on a, on a more wide scale. I think, and that makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna definitely uh, agree with that. I think because obviously, you know, with YouTube and uh, you know, just social media, you can it's reaching out to a much wider demographic, and you know. A, you know, a whole variety of people. And for me personally, what I really do enjoy about about it is, um, you know, people sharing their experiences with me. Like some of it can be 
really really uh, tough like it's um you know they, they go quite deep into it sometimes yeah. but i think for me it's i don't know if what the word would be i think it's it's nice and i guess just nice really that um people you know see me as worthy of you know of um me knowing their story and i really respect people that do uh, share that but i learn a lot from that mm, yeah it's not just like people from the usa and um the uk who, who comment you've got people who are, are you know like in places like india who, where autism acceptance or any sort of autism awareness is just zip mm. got situations where there's people who are on their own in in quite remote and small places don't really have any friends family um having very negative life experiences you know you just there's such a variety of, of people and stories and stuff and it's it's i guess it's hard not to reflect on that when you read them yeah uh, i mean like you say just the locations of uh, people i mean i've i've received like messages from people from brazil and stuff just saying like you know, it's so different over here in comparison to where you are and, you know, just the kind of um, things that people talk about. It's, mm. I don't know, like, I guess it's kind of a, it is a positive. It absolutely is. If, you know, people are sharing their stories and, you know, wanting to talk about it, I think it's great. And I guess also the other thing as well, what I think what we're doing is really great is sharing those experiences with others for them to feel uh, comfortable about sharing their own story or, you know, looking yeah. into looking into it for them for themselves. I think, I, I guess that's that for me is you know the most rewarding thing. You know, if anything that I do as a creator, you know, helps someone, I really want it to be that for them to watch a video or you know if it helps them, you know, go into a direction where it helps them in the long run. That is the most rewarding thing. I guess that's the rewarding thing and the positive thing about being uh, an autistic creator. I said social creator earlier. I don't know <laughs> I where know. that came from. I don't know where that came from, you know. <laughs> a sociable creator. <laughs> Especially we've all got to be at some level sociable in order to make it on YouTube. <laughs> or at least good at talking to a camera. <laughs> that's, um, that's always weird. I always find, I, I still find the, the act of talking to a camera very strange. Just to kind of briefly go over sort of the negatives f for yourself, would you say that being on YouTube and being a, a creator does have any sort of negative impacts on your quality of life or your day to day or your social life or anything like that? Yeah, I would definitely say so. Like I say, I think it does have more positives than negatives. But I think what people don't realize is the amount of like work that goes into keeping like a schedule and like <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no and um, like it's just all of the admin stuff it's not just about uh creating the videos at this point it's you know uh handling uh emails from companies wanting to work work with things and doing just other opportunities it's like it, it becomes like an actual job without it actually you know being an actual job i guess okay yeah <laughs> you, you, you know you you know right yeah it's um it's definitely it definitely does take over your life to some degree it's it's like the more that you put in the better results that you get but even even so the results are very slow to reveal themselves it's like you gotta keep working really really hard around the clock if you're doing like a podcast you've got to organize calls of people from different time zones and get them onto onto a service at, at the right time and sort of run them through the questions record it edit it for how long you want to depending on what quality you want yeah and then put it out and promote it and stuff it's like like it's at least 15 hours in that like <laughs> it's crazy yeah no man uh, i definitely i definitely get that but I guess also kind of the, the negative, one of the, well, one of the things of uh, social media, which I don't know, it's become a lot more apparent to me is the opinions of others, I guess, when it comes to your own content and things like, mm -hmm. I don't, 
I, I don't know. It's it's very it's very weird the internet sometimes because uh, you can have like ninety nine percent of the people I interact with are are really nice and you know they they get it and they're really uh, I don't know responsive. But you get that one uh, percent who I don't know don't say the the best things or the nicest of things and kind of get a little bit personal with it sometimes and I guess that's kind of the negative thing about it because even though it's the one percent it kind of eats in at you and it's the thing for me that I kind of fixate on and I don't know I I think I think all of us have this to a degree but I tend to focus on the negative thing like if it's like even if it's the tiniest thing that's the thing that sticks out and I'm just trying to figure out what's what they're saying is valid or are they really right about this and sort of double checking your videos and making sure that you are and uh, I just I, yeah I completely get it it's just sometimes it can eat up at you but it's kind of one of those things where if you see something bad you just try and hide it as soon as possible and divert your attention <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes you can get critical comments, which you can also see as negative sometimes, which I don't know, it's not the best way to be, I guess. But uh, I, I, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, if it's constructive, that's fine. You know, I can take constructive criticism if it's like something about the video. But when it gets personal and things that I can't change as a person, it's just, I, I don't know. It just makes me want to close my laptop and uh, go on the couch, pull a blanket around me and just be like no it does it does drain you in in that way but like mm. especially with podcasting and doing youtube videos it even even making videos even if you're not speaking to someone because you've got to well you don't have to but it helps to use your body language and your all those kind of non-verbal signals and and craft things it it does tend to drain my social battery like yeah like you just require so much intense concentration and thought and and planning and most of the time if if i'm in the stage of me- making videos and podcasts and stuff I, I usually don't have a lot of energy to spend time with my friends or at least time as well oh uh, no uh, especially with the time like i say i think it's mostly positive and oh, yeah quite and quite rewarding as well in multiple ways. I'm not going to quit anytime soon, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the positives of social media for everybody. You know, like n- non-creators in its many forms and, and platforms. What does what does social media bring to autistic individuals? Oh... I have to think back to when I wasn't actually creating. <laughs> when I wasn't actually creating, it could be things that that people have have told you, or I've heard a lot of people saying like, "I felt like the only oddball, <laughs> or the like an alien in in the world, and I never felt part of society." But now that I'm surrounding myself by autistic people on social media, I feel like I'm part of the world again. That kind of thing. Mm you know yeah no um i think that's the thing for me just to uh, agree with your point really i didn't really hang out with a lot of autistic people or autistic people that i could relate to you know yes. and i can't kind of have that that experience that's when you know when i was doing youtube i ended up finding these people on youtube and i was just like oh my gosh like people kind of I don't know. Even though it's not the same experience, of course, uh, but they made me realize that oh my god, there's uh, people who you know get me for me, and you know it's okay to um, have you know cuddly toys in you know your bedroom and stuff. You know it's okay to you know obsess over I don't know your uh, favorite TV show. You know even if people who are adults may think you know why do you like that. It made me kind of rediscover my autisticness. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with you as well. We're going to say this a lot in this podcast, but it's <laughs> just the um, the autism effects. I, do, <laughs> I feel like, we're, we're, or at least I've, I've heard from people um, as well about them having 
an idea or an expectation for how they should be before getting a diagnosis or before reading into autism and watching videos and stuff. But once they did those things, they sort of readjusted what what they should expect from themselves and what is going to work and the kind of things that that are going to bring them happiness and the confidence that that comes with wearing it on your sleeve you know there's i think for for autistic people social media is kind of like it it is like a haven for interacting with like-minded people it's it's Mm. honestly quite spooky the first time that you watch a video about autism because you're like i thought i was so individual i thought i was this unique amazing person with this quirky personality you know that good old tom (laughs) but nope there's lots of people who equally display those characteristics (laughs) but also as well because people display those characteristics and you just relate to them then it's i guess it makes the whole conversation about it so much easier and you know Mm. making making those connections i think is a lot easier as well but i guess it depends on what platform as well it depends on you know how you know you make those friendships because i think certain social media is a lot easier than others i mean i love instagram to be honest uh when it comes to social media like also i think youtube at this point you know it, it it's kind of a social media but I, I don't really see it as that I, it's like a half and half between like a video website and like a uh, like a social media like mm-hmm. it has like yeah. social media elements of course but yeah no i i quite like instagrams it's so you know I, I guess it's intuitive and there's so many i didn't actually realize this until um this year to be honest i didn't realize how many like autistic creators there are on instagram i did never actually fully it's massive um i think over lockdown i saw uh you know just deep diving into it more there's so many and it's i guess it's one of the more positive uh social medias as well so i don't know i've i've made quite a few uh, acquaintances and friends through that and um, so i guess it just depends on the individual you know um you know how they use that platform for me instagram is just one of those places i definitely feel a lot more at home on instagram it's it's there's some something about it I know that it's it's in the past been sort of critiqued critiqued as being quite narcissistically driven, but I feel like a lot of the the autistic content creators they they tend to make their own posts. They like design them, add different aspects to it. They they do like a a little short short kind of bit of writing on a certain topic. They spread information and talk to talk to people who who kind of need that support and help. And mm. it's just it. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it can be a bit annoying, but that's like the, the, the only thing, the only bad thing that's come out, come out of it for me is, you know, like just getting messaged by spam bots. <laughs> oh, so, I, I mean, I commented I, on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time I had a, a, a spam, uh, like a, a spam bot. If anyone decides to message me in whatever medium, you know, please be aware it does take me a while to actually get back to people sometimes. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think social media is great, but I, I guess for me, you know, it's just I need to figure out how I'm going to respond. And, you know, um, sometimes I might take a while or I might see the message and think I'm going to reply to that, you know, now and then it's five days later it's like oh gosh i need to reply yeah you left it on red and (laughs) so it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors timo if you love visual support in your scheduling timo is for you the app was designed for people with adhd and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Your support means the world. Anyway, let's get back into the show. The hardest thing for me is 
the the social time pressure. Like I, I I often can leave my inbox alone for like days just because I just don't have the energy to to start a conversation. It sounds weird, like for if if a neurotypical is listening to this, it sounds very weird. But I think you do you understand what I mean? It's just mm. like starting that conversation and engaging with it is like it distracts you from it's like a transition into a conversation and then out of one and then into another one and it just kind of leads me into a bit of a anxious state just constantly like messaging <laughs> no i no i i totally get that and um it 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 became it kind of becomes a juggling act uh, even though i'm not a juggler and in no way could i juggle but <laughs> it becomes like a massive massive thing and i guess it's just it does kind of impact in a way on someone's function and how they are, are how they are able to function as like an autistic person or something for me I, I mean you know for us as creators you know we're kind of just used to it you know is the thing that comes with being a creator but I don't know for someone who I don't know likes being on different social medias and stuff it can also be a little bit of a challenge it's a bit bit, bit kind of addicting as well like there's there's always more that you can do like there's you can always make one more post you can always do another story you could always add a different aspect to your channel to your page you could always you could, you could always contact people and develop connections as like the the problem for me is that it's not like it's it's unlimited so if mm-hmm. i get myself in one of those if if i get myself into that and i'm kind of in the flow state of using social media it's so hard for me to stop I can't. I just compulsively watch things on it and stuff, which I suppose could lead us into the, the sort of the the negative side to social media. Mm. I guess one of, one of the problems with it is you know we've heard a lot of things like FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. You know, people on Instagram generally are just you know your regular old Joe post pictures of themselves living the best life, but. It looks like they're living the best life because they're not posting the pictures of them laid in bed, eating Cheetos, getting all the dust in their chest hair. Like they're they're posting pictures of them on holiday or have just had a haircut or in the most scenic, like precise position that looks just amazing. Mm. I just think there's so many there's so many pitfalls that people can fall into. What is your experiences with that? Have you heard anybody sort of talking about how how difficult it can be sometimes or do you have kind of personal experience with that um i I guess you generally hear comments about you know people um seeing seeing things and being like oh i wish i was like this person because of what they're seeing on a social media or whatever i guess for me when people are like living their best life and they're like pristine like you say I, I I just don't think about it because I don't know, the more I think about it, the more I think, oh, I wish my life was like that. Or even though I don't want that life, I kind of, it makes, I think social media can sometimes make you think that's like the life that I would like to have. Or, you know, and it kind of makes you feel, oh, I wish I had more of this or more of that. So in that sense, I think on someone's mental health, that can be quite impactful if they're, I don't know, not necessarily aware of, you know, the things that do kind of go on within social media. Because, like, a lot of it, I, I, I don't know if it's a, a thing generally, but I feel like a lot of it is just for show or for a specific purpose, you know. I don't know, I tend to stay away from that and uh, stick to people who, I don't know, are real and just, you know, show you know the cheetos and the hair and like the <laughs> you know the kind of the wholesome stuff that's the kind of stuff i'm personally more drawn to i'm drawn to more real people and really like real experiences and stuff but i can definitely see that being an issue for some people you know when i was sort of writing sort of an outline for this podcast i was i was kind of thinking of the the different different types of people and and people in in different situations that could have a, a differing relationship with social media. Like if they have had a very, you know, a very bad childhood and which is is often the case with autistic people, they 
or very low self-confidence, then it can it can sometimes make you feel a bit inadequate, make you feel like you're not working hard enough or make you feel like you're not good looking enough or you like all those kind of things is um if you're in that kind of low confidence state you don't really have any friends you don't really have any long close relationships then you you can sometimes fall into a a little bit of a an envy hole if that makes Mm. sense you know just brewing with both negative emotion towards other people and yourself yeah no i definitely sympathize with that because like i mean when I was uh, first start, starting out on uh, YouTube and the things, I would like see my friends doing, you know, well. Even though I wished them, you know, you know, all of the success in the world, you know, and they're my friends and I love them dearly, and you know, I want them to succeed. It, at the time, it made me feel, oh, what am I? What can I do to improve things and things like that? Even though that's not the way it should be, that's kind of the way it was for me at the time, but. I think, I guess, yeah, I guess for me, it's just about just realizing, you know, your own value in yourself. And, you know, yes, social media can be a massive escape, but also realizing just, you know, I guess just your own value and, you know, just being being yourself and just being cool. Being cool. Being cool. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh I don't know what I mean either, but I I don't know. I guess just being yourself and, you know, just also just, I don't know, just trying to see things at face value, I guess. You know, just thinking about the positives rather than the negatives and just and not letting yourself be consumed by that, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I, I agree with you. Again, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that has become quite a media story, like something that makes headlines is social media's effect on everybody's general ability to function like their, their productivity their you know a lot a lot more children and, and adults these days display a lot of traits of like adhd or at mm. least like add or something like that because like these social media sites if if you allow them to do everything if you allow them to send you notifications and sort of send you dings and and play sound effects and stuff it kind of trains your brain to drop whatever it's doing whatever you're doing look at it and then and then reply and then it it has a way of kind of getting its claws into you and keeping you in that social media site for as long as possible have you found that it does affect your productivity sometimes or yes absolutely i've pretty much always got my phone nearby or you know in my hands i don't know it's it's not that i'm attached to my phone it's just i i use it generally as a coping mechanism for when i'm uh, out and about because um you know regardless of what people see on uh, youtube you know person that makes these videos and talks confidently i'm not the most sociable person i kind of need that prompting when i'm uh, talking to people so Quite often when I'm out and about and, you know, just with like family stuff, I will literally have my phone in my hands as like a crutch. Sometimes I'll get absorbed into, I don't know, reading YouTube comments or whatever. Or if I'm just at home, you know, I'm saying to myself, right, I need to do, I don't know, a wedding plan because I'm planning to get married yeah, at some point. <laughs> I was meant to get married uh, this year, but it got pushed back because of um, oh, everyone. Of course. Yeah, because of everyone's favourite uh, topic. It's, it's, it's happened to, to a few of people that I know. How, how is your uh, soon-to-be wife feeling about it? Uh, I, th- I think uh, she just is feeling the same as me. We just just do it and just, you know, just you know have the day that we want and things like that. But we rescheduled it for September, but then we re-rescheduled it for april next year so we're we're, we're optimistic uh we're, we're trying to be optimistic about it uh, <laughs> going, a, going ahead it's a very ropey situation that we find ourselves in sorry i completely diverted from from the from what we were talking about um i, I completely get like the distraction factor like mm. for me most of the time i've got my 
iPad on me. I'm always holding it. It's an iPad mini. I go about it with any, like everywhere. I get the mic taken out of me <laughs> from my friends for all oh, having my iPad on me all the time. And I use that. I use that to, as you said, look at YouTube comments and check social media and I use it to play music and I use it to play games like when I need to. And it's, mm. I, I do get that. It's kind of like a escapism anchor. Yeah. Which is it good is. in small doses. I, I guess the problem comes in when it, it sort of either controls how you how you go about your day or makes you, makes you so ingrained into it that you you lose you know precious time of s- sleeping and <laughs> precious time that you could you could be spent you could have spent doing something creative or f- or fun or socializing or stuff but you just kind of. I'm, I'm I'm basically talking about my experience with YouTube. That's the that's the main thing. Just constantly watching videos that constantly pick, constantly <laughs> are shoved in my face, and I can't stop. Sometimes, if I'm really feeling I'm low, I'll just watch them for hours. I was gonna say, sorry, go on. If I like had something to do, like when planning, uh, and then I go into TikTok and see like TikToks on cats. That's me for like half an hour. I love cat TikToks. Honestly, they they're just the most adorable things in the world. Especially when you get like the kittens and stuff. Uh, oh. I'm not a massive fan of cats, but I do like kittens. Well, I do think that there are some very large positives for autistic people in terms of using social media. You know, there, there are also some negatives, but I guess one of the dilemmas is what which platforms should you use? Do you think that there's any specific platforms that can have negative impacts on someone's mental health or someone's particular attitude to life? Yeah, in particular, probably Facebook for me. Uh, like I used to be on Facebook all of the time and uh, just get myself absorbed into you know people's statuses about. I don't know, whatever they're doing. I still go onto Facebook, but I don't really post anything on like my, their personal profile or anything because I just don't, yeah. I just, I, I don't really. Too much posting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Posted out from, from doing the YouTube stuff. <laughs> Pretty much. And also, um, I don't find myself to be that interesting in my uh, personal life. Uh, I mean, what am I going to say? At, I don't know, 7 p.m. tonight, I sat on the couch and just binged Star Trek The Next Generation, which I have been doing and I've been enjoying very much. But Facebook for me, it just comes off as very confrontational sometimes. I guess in particular, when it comes to like autism groups and stuff, it can be just one of those places where, you know, you can get support off people. And, you know, when people are supporting you, it's great on there. But I don't know, it's... Uh, Everyone's very opinionated on those groups. Very, very. Yeah, and just on Facebook in general, to be honest. But I know we've obviously talked about like our um, positive outlook when it comes to Instagram and things. I guess for me, that would be quite a good alternative to Facebook, even though Facebook owns Instagram. I, yeah. I, I just... <laughs> I, that, it's kind of weird how that's actually uh, how that's actually worked out. It's like Coca Cola with like Fanta and what what other kind of. I think Coca Cola owns like a large amount of the branded stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, I think they own they own Sprite, they own Oasis and things as well. They're, they're, they're absolutely all sorts, but it's it's just kind of weird how Instagram, even though it's owned by Facebook, it's just like. It, the polar opposite of it and for me i definitely feel a lot safer on instagram especially with like you know the other autistic advocates that talk on there as well as autistics you know just doing their thing you can kind of craft your own circle around you which can be it can be a good thing but i i guess you know it has it has its negatives as well mm-hmm. if you choose to surround yourself by people that make you feel bad then maybe like that could affect you you know I, i've kind of start to do, to do that you know just do i really want to to, to see these posts like did, did they actually make me want to be on instagram 
you can't really do that with Facebook groups. You can't. You could block everyone that you don't like, mm-hmm. and that would hide the messages. But it's it's not really possible, is it? It's you post something in a group, and you get a you get a lot of positive, nice things. But then you get this raining hellfire of in depth critiques of of what you said on on you know, <laughs> something that you didn't really put a massive massive amount of thought on, and then you get so. Yeah, Sometimes you get even like emotional abuse of people messaging you and saying like, you know, how dare you say that? And you just don't get that with Instagram. Uh, and I know, I know, I know what you mean. I actually had that on their Facebook because I posted it was like a news article on there, something that had happened, and literally, like, I, I just, I don't know, just said my piece on it, uh, said my thoughts on it, posted it, didn't think anything of it. Then the next morning, I just saw all of these comments being like. They're talking about this. You have no experience, or uh, uh, what, whatever else. It was. I ended up deleting the post because I was, I was just like, I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered with it. <laughs> but I've also noticed, actually, like uh, because I use quite a lot of social media anyway. I mean, Reddit for me, in terms of the autistic uh, community, has been well, in terms of my content, really amazing. But also, like Reddit's obviously just you know for people who are really into like like forum type type of things which i'm personally not but i do really like the communities over on reddit especially for the autism based stuff because like they obviously talk about like personal experiences and stuff in a lot more detail and but also they share like art and all of that amazing stuff which Mm. i really really love I guess it is a it's a lot more critical sometimes on Reddit. People are a lot more crit- critical. I guess that kind of comes with the, the the anonymous part. Or is 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 Reddit anonymous? Um, not particularly. I think you have to have like a a user. Well, I guess it, well, I guess it kind of is and it isn't. I guess it's kind of like um anything like I don't know like Twitter or something where you know you just have like a username you can like. Has have a picture as your profile and stuff. I guess, yeah, yeah, no, I, can, I actually kind of agree. I guess it's a, uh, you can be kind of anonymous on there. I've been on Reddit a few times, but I've never fully got into it because it's like I was trying to expand my social media, but I just realized that I was just spreading my time out even more thinly between these different social medias. Mm. Most of my experience comes from Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And let me tell you, like, I absolutely hate Twitter. I think it's awful Beca- because of the format and, and how you, you have to be very short in what you say. Mm. People respond to you very shortly as well without much further reading, just kind of ec- the extreme version of, of face value and they analyze the, the words that you use. And I've received the most criticism and... The, mo- the most criticism for, for what I say and believe on Twitter by people who don't know me. And you do get that on YouTube. That happens a lot. But it's like, I, I hardly ever use Twitter. And when, when I do, when I, I say something that I believe in, it's like I just get people who are just giving their, a snapshot of their, their thoughts in their brain. And they're not always the most positive and constructive <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll I tell you what actually I, um, I don't mind Twitter I, it's not my go-to social media but obviously for the uh, whole creator scenario that we are and both in videos. <laughs> oh god yeah <laughs> in terms of Twitter anyway you know it's not my go-to social media it's really confusing because especially on like a mobile phone or something you can uh, like you know go into someone's tweet and then see all of the responses and then it becomes like, I don't know, a tree growing out of the ground. It just, I don't know, you just go so deep into it. And it just, it's ever expanding. And it's just like, it's, it's too much. It's too much sometimes. It's uh, like branching it. off into different conversations if it's popular. And <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It actually, it actually is. And especially if you like go into, I don't know, the certain hashtags. I mean, on uh, Twitter, you have like hashtag actually autistic or hashtag asking autistic and you go go into there and like sometimes people will post on Twitter specifically like Fred upon Fred upon Fred and then you have individuals uh, posting on each individual tweet. So if it's like a Fred of, I don't know, 20 tweets or something, 
Jeez. It, it's it's just it's just a lot, really. Hello? Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you cut out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries. It's okay. We just we just didn't read the the flow of conversation. <laughs> no. I was like, where's he gone? Like, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I do think certain platforms are better than others. I think Instagram has its downfalls. Just to, just as a, sort of my own personal advice, I think that w- one of the the main problems with Instagram and within the autistic community, or just to, to prevent anybody at all in in a certain group, is that you tend to follow people that say stuff that you believe in, and the the people who have opposing opinions or you know places and and companies and organisations that you hate. I personally try and follow those people. Because I, I, I think you can very much get yourself into like an echo chamber with certain certain communities, and it can be hard to it can, it can be sometimes quite quite hard to to read something that you don't agree with and not emotionally respond and go into full on keyboard frenzy mode. I think it's mm-hmm. it's a very healthy thing to do to listen to someone's opinions because you can use those opinions, you can you can analyze it, and you can sort of read into it and have another reason to, you know, support support your your belief or idea. Or you could just be completely changed. You could agree with them. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that, that you are gonna go all radical or, or anything like that. But if you do read into it and you you look at a wide variety of opinions, then it kind of makes you a more individualistic kind of person. Does that make sense? I'm trying to explain it in the right way. Um, probably the word I would use is well-rounded individual. Or yes, well-rounded that's, person. that's what I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but what what sort of advice could you give to people around sort of adapting how they use social media? Oh, I think for me, things that tend to help, firstly, just you know, if you've got a lot of social media or you're using a lot of social media, if you need time to yourself, they turn notifications off. Quite honestly, there was a point where I was receiving daily messages on uh, Facebook Messenger, for example. I was getting so kind of overwhelmed with people just messaging me. Now, it was just a mixture of people. So, you know, friends and family and stuff. But that was just too much. So I was just... Uh, I was just like, do you know what? I need to turn the notifications off. So I did. And then, <laughs> of course, I did my uh, my policy of leaving uh, a few days to respond. But that, that's what I kind of needed to do. And I think uh, for those who, especially if they're on the spectrum as well, if they're, if you're feeling overwhelmed by it, like just the simple act of turning notifications off for a period of time can be incredibly helpful. Also maybe allocating time uh, to doing that would be helpful. It, To be honest, it's probably something I would, sh- I should really be doing for, for myself to actually manage my time a little bit better. Because when I, I don't know, edit a video, sometimes I'll get like bored with the process or I just need like that distraction. So I will go on to TikTok to look at like um, TikToks of cats. I don't know. What, what would you uh, say, Tom? Apart from sort of, widening your circle i think it's you know it's it's good to have that but it's it's important to follow them with the intention of sort of as you said rounding yourself out and developing your own opinions and stuff but if you have like a, like friends people that, that you, you met in the past and every time that something of theirs comes up and you just you just feel some large amount of negative emotion or just any any sort of negative emotion towards them or to yourself just unfollow them like or or mute mute the notifications that you get from them or i know with facebook you can unfollow people they don't know about it but you can still say stay friends with them but Mm. you don't have to see the posts um doing that with like for example on instagram sort of if you follow models that have the ideal for you maybe don't follow them if they if they make you feel bad about yourself and it it's not constructive in any way for you, then just unfollow them. Um, even if they look nice 
or even if you you can sort of daydream about yourself being that you know so, sometimes that can be a motivator for people but if 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 you find that that's the case for you when you it doesn't motivate you it just kind of holds you back and makes you feel awful about yourself then you know sort of crafting your circle or your the the things that you you like and follow is is quite a, a good way of using it more consciously i guess rather than oh this person looks great i'm gonna follow them <laughs> oh this person <laughs> a little bit sexy um <laughs> you know it's it you just gotta have that awareness about you and it can eat away at you if you're having a bad day like just a post from someone that you don't like and then picture of this amazing person with this amazing life like you just don't need it follow real people mm. who talk about everything <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that i personally like to do uh, now it's probably a bit difficult with the current situation but they I'll, I'll talk to people very sporadically but you know the people that i meet up with time to time like my best friend and things like that like we talk over messenger and stuff but i don't really tell them like a lot of what's going on i save it for when i actually meet the person yeah yeah for for me that it just kind of creates that you know need to go see them and come off social media sometimes because i think we can all get absorbed by social media uh but for me that's kind of a thing which kind of optimizes like my time of you know being on social media versus you know in the real world where there's real people and real experiences yeah i i, I think i get what you what you're saying like uh, as i've been using social media more for youtubing and and stuff like that i i have a very low tolerance for talking to people online <laughs> like mm. as i said my, my social battery is usually quite drained and my energy levels and my time and i used to solely use social media to talk to people and although that was that was good for me to kind of network and make friends it didn't transfer very well to the real life you know mm. and it, i'd find that i spend the majority of my socializing on these these platforms rather than meeting up with people or calling with people so sometimes like adding that aspect of the person adding a more real uh, engagement to talking with people i think is important you know, like sending a voice message or calling someone you know sometimes that can be you know enough to stop you constantly like looking at your messages and and waiting for someone to reply and oh honestly like you can you can get in yourself some right states if someone hasn't replied to you in a certain amount of time and i've experienced that as well and i know people that 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 say the same and it's it's just about kind of having or scheduling a time to talk to someone in a, at a more personal level i think is 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 the best way to use it message people ask them what they're doing see if they want to talk or have a call or meet up and then go from there like i don't think it should solely be your method of communication if that makes sense no no that makes total sense and uh just uh with the whole um voice memo memoing thing i actually prefer doing voice memos over actual typing out messages it's it's it makes it more person personable or i think that's the word personal yeah it makes it more personal and i don't i don't know it's just it's just nice it's just nice when you go um you know you you actually hear someone's voice instead of reading it on a on a message yeah on a message and you know it's actually easier i think it's actually easier which actually i guess helps if you're, you know, you you don't have the energy to, you know, type out a message to a long conversation, it actually makes it easier, I think. Hmm. You just got to get over that initial fear of talking. <laughs> but to be honest, uh, for me personally, like I like I stammer quite a uh, quite a lot anyway. Uh, it's it's just a part of me. Um, you know, I I don't really mind it. It's it's obviously a nuisance, but you know, it. It actually helps, you know, from like a social point of view, just actually, you know, send voice uh, memos off. It does, it does actually help in uh, certain situations, you know, just getting that practice in, especially during uh, these times where we can't, you know, obviously see people day to day. By the way, your your stammering absolutely has no effect on the quality of your conversation, your your um communication. Honestly, like 
I have a little bit of a stammer, and it, I guess it is something that sort of comes with the the bundle of nerves that my brain was formed by. But <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't detract from it. If anything, it gives you a little bit more realism and relatability, and it's um, one one of the nice things about the the internet is that you know if if you excel in in certain areas and you're good at talking and you're good at communicating thoughts and feelings. It doesn't really matter about kind of the superficial stuff. Like people, people say that I speak like a robot and I'm like monotone and I agree, but <laughs> it works for this podcast because it's a chill one. Apart from when I just raise my voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, to be, to be perfectly honest with the whole stammer thing, it, I don't know, because I'm surrounded by um, non-autistic people quite a lot of the time. I think, you know, I see people just generally talking. It, I, it's the first thing I notice, like, oh, they, they're not, they don't stammer. It's, it's just, a, it's just a thing I, I don't consciously think about, but I do kind of worry about how other people perceive it. So, yeah, so thank you for actually like, just saying it's uh, not an issue. It, it makes, it, I don't know, it makes me feel like nice about myself, I guess. <laughs> honestly like i only follow one podcast really and it's not mine don't worry (laughs) i follow this podcast called the triforce podcast which is a group of middle-aged dudes talking about games and literally anything Mm -hmm. and the guy who makes it he's called lewis he has a stammer like he he stammers like his podcast is like massively successful it doesn't have any impact on on how people perceive you and if it if it does that's that's their problem because it's just like <laughs> who cares like it's literally something that you can't control so andy what are the three main things that you want people to take away from this podcast hmm three main things i guess for me that people should take away is that social media as lovely as it is and as amazing that it is, you know, you shouldn't believe everything that you, you see on social media as, I don't know, just a general rule, you know, like what we've talked about, you know, with um, Instagram and the way that you kind of see someone's reality or their version of reality, you know, I think just being mindful that, you know, not everything that you see online is necessarily like a true reflection of the person. Secondly, that autistic people, you know, I think, Using social media, you know, big, big thing for all of us on the spectrum and can be an absolutely incredible place, especially when you get a bunch of autistics in a, in a room together using, you know, social media and uh, all that lovely stuff. I think social media has really, really helped autistics. It's helped me and I can only imagine it's helped yourself, Tom, as well in a multitude of ways. And I guess... The last bit to take away from this podcast is that just being yourself on social media, I think, is a great thing. And, you know, you shouldn't be uh, ashamed for, you know, the things that you can't do. Be proud of the things that you can do, you know, saying that on social media and, you know, just helping others because of, you know, the experiences that you've had, you know, through social media and, you know, whatever else. It's a good thing. And I think people do it more that's kind of why i do you know youtube to try and you know help others through my experiences and you know if i can do that you know i feel fulfilled i guess for me that's uh, something that i want people to take away from the pod really brilliant thank you very much for those (laughs) we have the very last question what does autism mean to you andy oh God, it's such an open-ended question. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> uh, for me, autism used to mean, I don't know, that it was a bad thing. You know, uh, it used to be, I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that. And, you know, I, because of that, I thought quite negatively of myself. Uh, now, because of doing all this stuff on social media, being a content creator, YouTuber, that definition has been redefined. So for me, autism means being a genuine person who, yes, may have struggles, but, you know, it's about seeing past the things that are, like, visible and actually trying to understand the person within. Because if you understand the person within, it 
honestly opens up so many doors and you learn so much from other autistics as well, you know, despite, you know, the challenges. Like I stammer on pretty much every word, but, you know, I think if people take the time to actually listen to what I'm actually saying or, you know, try to understand my point of view through my actions and all that stuff, I guess people can then see the the person that I am, despite the things that I'm not necessarily the best at. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> no wrong answers at all, which is the beauty of an open-ended question. True. Very true. To uh, counteract the ambiguity of it. <clears throat> okay, so this has been perhaps the longest episode that I've recorded in a while. I wanted to create a episode that was a little bit longer because people have sort of asked for me to have you on and you know we've we've had had that bit of history sort of working together on YouTube and mm. and doing that kind of stuff. I thought it'd be nice to give people give people an idea of of sort of who you are and and sort of try and introduce you know the the things that you you podcast and and stuff like that. So um, thank you, thank you for coming on to talk to me. Uh it's been an absolute pleasure, Tom. Uh, just thank you so much for having me on. And I was just gonna say, you know, it's, it was really surprising that uh, people suggested me to come on to your uh, podcast. Yeah. But what was it? Anyone that suggested me, uh, just thank you. And yeah, just again, uh, Tom, thank you so much for having me on. Like I said before we hit record on this, you know, this was on my bucket list of things to do. So thank you for fulfilling that dream for me. Andy, this comes to this part of the episode where we give out our links. And I'm sure that you've got quite a few links for us that I can put down in the description. Would you like to tell people about where they can find you? Yep, certainly. So... You can find me on YouTube at www.youtube.com forward slash IndieAndy. And that's IndieAndy spelled I-N-D-I-E-A-N-D-Y. For your Facebooks, Twitters, Instagrams, it's IndieAndy UK. Uh, TikTok, I think, is the same as well, but I don't really post on there. My podcast, the Unmasked podcast, is on the YouTube channel, Indie Andy. It's you know, it's basically part of the same same thing, but you can find all the episodes on you know Spotify or Anchor. Is it Unmasked podcast? Pop 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 pop. Un Unmasked podcast. I have trouble saying that as well, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I think it's I think it's like anchor.fm at the unmasked podcast with spaces or dashes or something um but yeah so there we go find it in the description yes it'll be in the description yes have a, <laughs> have a look uh, have, have a look in there hopefully you enjoy well i definitely encourage all of you to go follow andy's youtube channel he posts very regularly and a lot of stuff around autism and as you've probably gathered from the podcast is a really lovely dude. He deserves to to get the recognition, and he, he puts the work in for it. So always go go over and uh, check his stuff out, and if you like it, then give it subscribe and stuff. In terms of finding the Forty Forty podcast, you can always find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and of course on the Asperger's Growth Channel on YouTube. If you want to, I would always recommend going to the Apple Podcasts and Spotify because. That's kind of where it's based. YouTube stuff is just, you know, for, for people who don't have that. <laughs> of course it is, of course. Other stuff that you can follow if you want to stay up to date with my life, know what's happening, know the kind of things that I'm doing in the mainstream, you know, you might miss out on that stuff if you don't follow the socials. Very easy to find on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Asperger's Growth, you know where to find me. You know where to find me by now. And, of course, if you have a story a story or experience or, or knowledge of a certain topic around autism and mental health that you want to talk about, you can send me a message, send me an email at aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. Thank you very much again, Andy, for coming on. And this is the part that we, we had a little bit of a joke about, <laughs> um, the good old ending of the podcast. How do you do it? You've just you've just gone through the motions. You've got over that that initial anxiety about being recorded. You've 
gone for it, you've gone into the zone and then you've you burnt out and now how do you end it? I guess one way of ending it is if you're on Apple Podcast, you know, make sure you leave a, a review in a five star oh, that's and, a good and a five star rating because you know it helps it helps Tom Tom out, of course. But I guess a way to end it, I don't know, to be honest. Maybe say saying uh, hope you have a nice day and goodbye, maybe. That might be that might be something. <laughs> that's too respectful. I can't do that. I know. <laughs> it's too <laughs> respectful for me. With my ego that's bursting at the seams, of course. Have a good day, guys. See you later. <laughs> Bye.